Now, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone online. And welcome to day two of this web seminar on UNGAS and beyond, leading the fight against corruption. I am Liv Torres, the director of Pathfinders, the multi-stakeholder platform for peace, justice, and inclusion. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event, co-sponsored with the Open Government Partnership. We gather in the recognition that corruption is a key obstacle to the achievement of the 2030 agenda and the realization of peaceful, just and inclusive societies. We know that corruption is costing societies millions of dollars, money that is needed for funding of health, education, infrastructure, and the, the recovery we will battle with for years after the pandemic. Corruption-related crimes cost, according to the UNODC, developing countries about 1.26 trillion annually, and thereby also rob citizens of the right to decent and improved lives. Hopes for trillions, millions of people. We know that corruption undermines the trust, which is so needed in the fragile social economic processes we are confronted with. We know that there's a great appetite amongst the public for action against corruption. Sarah Cliff highlighted yesterday the results of surveys from Transparency Global Surveys, for example, which showed that 57% think that governments are doing too bad a job on corruption. UN 75 survey showed same results, a great appetite among people for their politicians to fight corruption. We know also that there are several leaders and countries that are showing initiative and ambitions, as we heard yesterday, several examples of, in order for them to fight corruption. And we know that in 2021, there are a number of opportunities and venues in which the subject is being debated and discussed and we must now seize upon the opportunities to make a significant progress in the fight against corruption. Yesterday, we addressed the challenges, but also achievements around some of the main corruption issues, including open contracting, beneficial ownership, and asset recovery. We discussed the technical aspects surrounding these issues, as well as the many proposals and opportunities to deal with them at national and international level. There is a widely shared realization that we need to act to promote financial accountability, transparency, and integrity. Today, we are going to talk more about the space for opportunities and action in 2021. The new openings for ambitions, for showcasting commitments, and for pushing for greater action, as well as political ambitions. There are several opportunities. We had the Factive Panel report launched a few days ago. This year, there will be UNGAS G7 meetings in June, the HLPF in July, and UNGA and G20 meetings later in the year, as well as the OGP Global Summit in Seoul later in the year. The OECD Integrity Forum in March next year, is going to offer new opportunities. So the spaces and openings are there. We know that success in fighting corruption requires political will, perseverance, and a commitment to continuously upgrade institutions over many years. We know the gains are high. Countries that significantly reduce corruption are rewarded with searches in tax revenues, and thereby additional resources for health, welfare, education, infrastructure, with also following increased trust and social capital. We know in addition that while the adoption of the UNCAC in 2003 was a groundbreaking event, much has changed in the international and financial landscape. And we are now dealing with a number of issues that were not even included in UNCAC. Thus, it is essential to find ways to deal with the new realities that countries and citizens 
institutions and corporations are facing. Now, we are having a great few people who are going to address the issues and kick us off. We will have framing remarks by Alejandro Alvarez, director for the rule of law unit in the executive office of the secretary general. We will have a panel following the ambassador, Mr. Hyung Koo Moon, ambassador for anti-corruption cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Korea. Alfredo Duranta, coordinator for international anti-corruption activities, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Italy. And Tony Bosu, deputy director of thematic policy areas of the OGP. Before I hand it over to Alejandro, just follow the chat box a little bit about the logistics of the web seminar. Follow the chat box. There will be openings for questions at various intervals during the web seminar. And we will pick up on them from the chat box. And uh, there's also a Q&A session, but we will give you, we will return to the questions as we come uh, get on in the program. With those few words, let me hand it over to Alejandro, who will address the importance of the corruption subject for the Secretary General in the post-COVID time. Uh, we'll touch on the UN common position and the need for governments to use this opportunity and the spaces that we now have. So welcome everyone. And with those few words, Alejandro, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Liv, and, and, um, and hello to everybody. Thank you uh, to the Pathfinders and to the Open Governance uh, Partnership for organizing this event and for inviting us. Um, well, you know, I will I will address the issue from a I would say corporate or you know political point of view, uh, if you wish, um, uh, because certainly this is on one side a good opportunity, and on the other side is also a reason for concern. Um, first of all, um, I, I've been I've been listening to the conversation yesterday. It was really very interesting. Um, and a number of you know good examples and practices you know were there. So uh, thank you for for that. In particular, um, uh, Alicia Barcena uh, mentioned a number of things that were important for this conversation. Now I want to 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 to, um, uh, to frame the conversation on two issues. On one side, uh, the, the the corruption of where we are, if you wish, following the issue. Um, you know, it has been said already. You know how much money co you know, corruption costs. Uh, how important it is for the SDGs. So I'm not going to repeat the message, but I do want to say that before the pandemic, we were already looking at the issue uh, with concern because you might, re you might remember that in 2019, we had a wave of demonstrations and protests around the globe uh, with a lot of discontent and anger uh, and much of this uh, discontent and anger from people were related to what was perceived as a corrupt elite <clears throat> and you know political parties that do not represent us uh, that you know these people that are governing us that only are looking for their own interests uh, and that has been you know I, I then obviously you know the pandemic took us to a different planet altogether. Uh, but I, I want to re, you know to remind everybody that that does, this is where we were in 2019, and and this is where we still are in a way. Uh, and I want to to be clear on that people do not have trust in governments right now. Mm -hmm. People do not have trust in elites and in political parties. And I have to say, many political part, many political uh, people, and many governance uh, government uh, people are not behaving properly. So they are. It's not that they are not reasons for concern. So, but but what I I would say is that this is where we were before the pandemic. Now, what happened with the pandemic is that, well, uh, a number of uh, resources you know start to be to be mobilized. Now the concerns. Uh, it became uh, uh, related to how to uh, contain and now how to recover, you know, from the pandemic. So, you know, 
purchasing equipment uh, for medical purposes. Now the issue of vaccines um, and how those are distributed and who uh, takes the vaccine first or not, and how I benefit, you know, how my political friends uh, benefit uh, first, even if they are not eligible right now. Those are the issues that are dis discussed in many countries. So uh, the, the issue of uh, corruption now is also linked to the uh, to uh, pandemic recovery, and uh, and I uh, and, and that this is adding to the mistrust that we had before. So I want to be clear on that regard. I don't, you know, we don't. When we look at what can happen in the future, uh, we don't see any reason for this anger and this mistrust to go away after the pandemic, if we have an after the pandemic. Mm. So, <clears throat> it, so it might happen that 2021 or 2022 will you know, see another way from different characteristics, but the corruption, the mistrust, the anger will still be there. Mm. And, and corruption issues are so much at the heart of what we are talking. Uh, so from where we are sitting, we are seeing that not addressing the issue, not creating the, uh, the, 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 the space for trust is actually destabilizing for democracies. So this is the urgency that I would like to convey, uh, uh, you know, in addition to what has been, uh, you know, discussed uh, from yesterday and maybe uh, today in terms of, you know, how the money flows and how, you know, this money is diverted from uh, <coughs> development purposes. So we did look, we do look at the UNGAS as a, as a great opportunity, maybe a unique opportunity, who knows, to address some of those topics. Uh, the Secretary General um, has issued a couple of statements related to uh, corruption. Well, one was during the pandemic about corruption and COVID-19. Uh, it was a video statement. I hope that you uh, you saw that. On the other side, uh, for the international layer of, of anti-corruption, he also mentioned the importance of, of UNGAS and, you know, and, and how much we expect member states to step up to the challenge. Uh, so, you know, that is uh, an important thing. And on top of that, you know, in August uh, last year, we issued a common position, a UN system common position uh, on vis-a-vis -vis UNGAS, you know, looking at UNGAS. And in this, uh, in this uh, common position, we had on one side, um, you know, a commitment from the UN system um, to step up support to member states on their anti-corruption efforts, uh, to mainstream as well uh, uh, anti-corruption issues on uh, UNGAS recovery plans, uh, UNGAS COVID-19 uh, recovery plans, um, uh, and support in general from you know to uh, UN country teams to support member states, etc. Our number of, uh, and, and there is a number of ideas innovative ideas, if you wish, that are placed in an annex, uh, which the purpose of these ideas was to trigger a conversation. We wanted uh, the member, member states to see that there were some ideas uh, around there, that, they, you know, that it was a time maybe to think a little bit outside the box, that UNCAC is at the heart of what we do, but it might not be uh, entirely sufficient, that we needed new and better instruments to support member states. So I'm not going to go, uh, uh, to go in detail you know, to the uh, different uh, ideas in the annex. I would invite you to, uh, to look at them, but that goes you know, much you know, both on, in the area of you know, you know, beneficial ownership, uh, uh, registries, but also you know, ideas uh, linked to uh, international uh, prosecution uh, or national prosecution of international corruption. Uh, we are, uh, in, you know, much more efforts needs to be done. I mean, you know, uh, the lesson learned from, from those cases uh, in, in maybe Latin America is that, you know, you cannot just, you know, natural, national jurisdictions need support to gather evidence uh, and, and to carry on with the cases. So there has to be some mechanism where we can 
uh, that we can support national prosecution. There are some ideas in the annex that I would like to invite you uh, to take a look at. So to wrap up, what I would say is our, uh, we have a lot of expectations with UNGAS and we like to see leadership from member states to introduce in this you know, outcome document or the whatever outcome of the, com the conference will be of more and better instruments. We do have concerns that the conversations so far are not going far enough. And, uh, and we do have concerns that, you know, maybe the headlines after the UNGAS, you know, in the media will be, well, the UN, you know, cannot solve the issues of corruptions of corruption anymore. And you know, this is a genuine concern that we have. I, you know, I, obviously, I am uh, I'm sharing because uh, a, 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 there is still an opportunity to, uh, to kind of you know, redirect some efforts to get a stronger outcome. You know, UNGAS is not the only, uh, the only opportunity, but certainly it's a very, very good opportunity. We will, I will, it will get a lot of media attention and political uh, energy. So we would like to see much more leadership from member states uh, into introducing ideas uh, and, and, and tools and, um, you know, and advance our possibilities as a United Nations to go uh, through that. I haven't uh, referred to other topics like political culture um, because I, I think you know, the issue is much more than technical instruments. And in many countries, we have an issue with political parties, financing political parties, and in general, political culture. Uh, but well, you know, it's too 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 little time to, you know, to address uh, that. But I think that you know, my my main message is already uh, out there. That means that my time is out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. And I think uh, that appeal and message went out forcefully, strongly uh, to everyone. We need leadership. Now, with those words, uh, it is my great pleasure to hand it over to uh, Ambassador Moon, who will address Korea's commitment to the global anti-corruption agenda, including in this period when you are co-chair of the OGP and the calls that you will be putting out in the period, we are looking forward to see both the calls and the commitments and the leadership that Alejandro is referring to. So please, the screen is yours. Okay. Well, uh, I, uh, okay. Uh, um, well, actually, I I prepared the presentation, of the ten minutes presentation, and now I have to uh, shorten my presentation in five five minutes. So uh, I am just just a little bit uh, embarrassed, but uh, anyway, um, actually, I'm a newcomer uh, to this group. I mean, UNGAS and uh, OGP. So. Uh, frankly speaking, I'm not quite well familiar with the specifics of the agendas of OGP and UNGAS. So uh, I will try to introduce Korean experience. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So on behalf of the government, um, I would like to talk about the Korea, Korea's effort to uh, in battling corruption mm. uh, and uh, pa Korean polish directions for the future and the uh, role of Korea in cooperating with the international community, mainly focusing on institutional or legislative reforms, okay? Um, well, a few years back in 2016, the South Korea was in a state of emergency sparked by the interference with the national affairs by a confidentiality of the then President Park. Uh, the Korean people and civil society dealt with the problem in a peaceful and democratic way, demonstrating that Korean society would not tolerate corruption anymore, any longer, and that it was capable of addressing such a challenge on its own. 
the, um, the current administration, which took office in May 2017, recognizes corruption as one of the gravest and the most urgent challenges that Korean society faces. So it therefore prioritized the strong anti-corruption polish uh, in the national agenda. The main arms for uh, implementing anti-corruption in Korea are first uh, ACRC, uh, Anti-Corruption and uh, Civil Rights Commission, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, developed a five-year comprehensive anti-corruption plan and also oversee uh, the, uh, the, the, the integrity level of all levels in the public institution and uh, society as a whole. And the second arm is the Anti-Corruption Polish Consultation Council. With the, the council is presided by the president of Korea and uh, is where government ministries and agencies that are relevant to fight uh, against corruption come together to discuss anti-corruption and fairness policy. The council has um, convened six times so far and has regularly received the reports on the implementation status of five-year comprehensive anti-corruption plan. Okay, um, the sum of the commitment completed from the five-year compre comprehensive anti-corruption plan include the first, the enactment of Public Funds Recovery Act. The uh, formal name of this act is, is, is long. I mean, uh, the act on prohibition of false claims for public funds and the recovery of illicit profits. So the act was designed to increase transparency in operating public finance by prohibiting false claims of public funds and the building a system to recover illicit gains obtained through fraudulent claims. It has been effective as of January 2020. And I think this, this act may be helpful to, uh, to find out uh, the illicit claims in the crisis of pandemic, uh, the, the, this pandemic. The second commitment completed from the plan is strengthening the protection of public interest whistleblowers. Well, we recently introduced a system where whistleblowers can make a proxy report through lawyers without revealing one's personal information uh, with the uh, aim of better protecting confidentiality when whistleblowers speak up. Um, Okay, and uh, another initiative is the Corruption Investigation Office for High-Ranking Officials, CIO, which was launched back in January this year. Uh, discussions around the establishment of uh, such an office had continued for the past two decades. And it finally became a reality after the current administration pushed it forward with the agenda as one of its key commitment. Uh, crimes committed by high-ranking public officials, including politicians, uh, par uh, member of parliament, uh, judges, prosecutors, uh, erode public trust in institutions and uh, degrade transparency and accountability in the public sector. Um, and this, the office was established uh, as an independent enforcement agency, not influenced by the political power and economic power as well, you know, to enhance the nation's transparency and confidence in the public sector. Um, I believe that Korea's efforts have paid off, as you, as you may know, uh, in the, two, the 2020 Corruption Perception Index recently re uh, released by Transparency International, Korea earned a record high score of 61 out of 100, mm. uh, thanks to the government effort uh, and the uh, engagement of society as a whole. Uh, recent initiative, uh, 
the Korean government is working on this year is to introduce a conflict of interest prevention law. Uh, each public agency at all levels has and operates its own code of conduct, which requires organizational members to avoid conflict of interest. And also the ACRC supervises it. However, the codes are not legally binding. And so it's difficult to punish top ranking officials, such as head of the agency for a violation of a code. Uh, that's why we are trying to pass a conflict of interest prevention law. Another major initiative is the promotion of public-private governance. As all of you may agree, the government effort alone will not lead to a transparent society. Cooperation with civil society organization, business, and citizens is a must. Uh, in particular, as a part of our commitment in the fifth OGP National Action Plan this year, we'll spread the culture of integrity across communities through the private public consultative councils for transparent society. It's a long name, huh? But uh, uh, so the government and uh, business people and the uh, public, uh, the agencies get together and uh, discuss the uh, corruption related issues. Um, as for the, as for, uh, I have a time limit? Maybe Almost. turn towards closing remarks. Okay, okay, okay. Then, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, the, uh, although vaccines are being distributed, the COVID-19 pandemic still has an enormous social and economic impact preventing individuals from returning to a normal life. Particularly in this type of crisis situation, it is essential to ensure citizens the right to know, which, which means that the government should proactively share information that people want to know and should know, uh, rather than merely build a legal and institutional foundation for access to information, because corruption usually means pursuit of self-interest at the expense of others, and as a result of information and power asymmetry. And also I, I could observe that um, uh, the relaxing of rules or pro procedures designed to safeguard fairness and justice in the name of emergency measures to control the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That could be a cause of corruption, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's all, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry about the time restrictions here. Um, okay. um, we are looking forward to see how you are going to follow this up, both at the national and international level, of course. Now I hand it over to Alfredo Durante to hear more about Italy's commitment to the, to the global anti-corruption agenda. Uh, and also through your G20 anti-corruption working group priorities. Please, the screen is yours, Alfredo Durante. Thank you, thank you, Liv. Uh, I, I uh, uh, want to highlight a few points in my capacity of chair of the G20 anti-corruption working group and also taking into account that Italy is the co-chair of the steering group of the Open Government Partnership for the, uh, this three-year uh, mandate. Uh, first of all, uh, Alejandro set the tone about uh, corruption nowadays. We believe uh, that uh, the uh, G20 should uh, better uh, uh, appraise uh, how corruption manifests it today, because corruption has changed over the last 20, 25 years. It's not just a matter of uh, uh, bilateral uh, bribery uh, scheme. Uh, we need to uh, grasp a better uh, knowledge and understanding of corruption nowadays. And to do that, we need to uh, improve um, methods for measure corruption in a more objective and evidence-based way. And secondly, we have to uh, understand uh, how to tackle corruption 
when it is exploited by criminal groups. So the infiltration of organized crime through corruption in the public sector. And again, uh, we need to delve into uh, emerging risk areas. Uh, we are particularly focusing sport integrity uh, uh, this year, since sport is a, a world where uh, the governance is basically with uh, uh, private bodies and we need to improve the dialogue and cooperation with the law enforcement to detect and investigate uh, corruption cases. Since the COVID pandemic has uh, 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 hit the uh, health sector and also the recovery programs mobilize a huge amount of uh, public resources, there are heightened risks of uh, uh, corruption and fraud. And of course, we are in the uh, stream of recovering better. That means also to ensure integrity and transparency to the management of public contracts. So we have decided this year to launch another specific exercise to the group, with the group. We want to uh, uh, um, highlight what, is, what does it mean having corruption in times of crisis, general crisis, uh, also uh, a, a general scope, not just a local or geographical crisis, could be a pandemic, could be uh, 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 a natural disaster or the strong alteration of the uh, macroeconomic situation of a country. But how we should behave in, in times of crisis. And we want to uh, make a more general reflection of what the international community should, should do uh, uh, in times of crisis, how to uh, ensure adequate standards of integrity and transparency while at the same time coping with the disruption of the supply chains and procure urgently goods and services that are vital for the, uh, uh, for the lives of, of, of the people. So this is more or less our uh, agenda. We are working uh, already and uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, also assessing the past commitments of G20 countries, we are focusing the accountability report this year on beneficial ownership transparency. We want to check how G20 countries have implemented uh, um, previous commitments. Um, I don't want to go uh, in too much detail because I, I spoke at the panel at the intersessional Ungas last week. So I uh, uh, interested people can, can see the, the summary. We are basically pushing for a dynamic uh, uh, um, concept of beneficial ownership, not just the legal formal requirement of the effective owner, but also uh, through the concrete functioning of the and the business, daily business of the company uh, and, and the kind of, of re business relations it has every day. Now, uh, um, uh, I leave the uh, scope and content part and I go more on the methodology because I think uh, it's important also to give a couple of uh, 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 words on that. We are uh, assisting at a mutually reinforcing process of different fora, uh, in, in particular the G20, uh, which is uh, a leading by example uh, uh, forum community um, that has to uh, 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 give political impetus and guidance to individual and collective action to address uh, corruption and the UNGAS process, which is more inclusive because it's under the ages of the United Nations. And we also, uh, after the UNGAS, have to take into account that uh, later this year, there will be uh, uh, the ninth conference of states parties hosted by, by Egypt. And all these uh, meetings uh, uh, really um, give us the, uh, uh, in, the uh, importance of 2021 as a golden year for anti-corruption. Of course, each work stream has its own specificities, uh, but we could benefit from the cross-fertilization. For example, uh, in 2019, uh, new items like sport integrity and uh, measurement of corruption were the object of specific uh, cost-uncut resolutions. 
and then they became G20 priorities. And these two items are also acknowledged in the draft political declaration of the UNGAS. So uh, I see a, a very important opportunity of giving a strong political impetus to the fight against corruption. And of course, recovering better requires a strong leadership and we are fully supportive of the appeal of the Secretary General and of the common position of the UN agencies on uh, towards the UNGAS. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are going to take that headline with us, the golden year for anti-corruption work. Tone, it's time for you to take this forward. Thank you, Liv, and, and, and thank you. Uh, really great to follow Ambassador Moon and, and uh, Alfredo Durante. This is a, a really good note that they set out for this conversation. And thank you to our partners at Pathfinders for co-organizing this really important conversation with us uh, at OGP. Now, um, I think it's been really instructive listening to all the speakers yesterday and, 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 and um, you know, um, the, the three that came before today uh, and the member state interventions. And it, what has been really heartening to see is the shared commitment to tackle corruption. And I think this is, you know, it's always good to start from a common, uh, common goal and it's really good to see that's there. But we're here precisely because we need to ensure that key global forums this year, starting with UNGAS, go beyond just a shared vision for corruption, but make sure that we actually tackle um, implementation challenges that we all know exist in terms of looking at anti-corruption action. And to ensure that the momentum doesn't just stop at a high level declaration in UNGAS, but really stretches beyond to other multilateral conversations that we have the rest of the year and beyond. Um, so on that, I just want to highlight a few key points, building on some of the conversations yesterday and earlier today, um, to ensure that we really talk about how we can do justice to this critical moment that we've all talked about, that 2021 is climbing out of a pandemic and seeing where, where we need to tackle corruption holistically. So the first one on that is really, I think, as we've seen yesterday and today, is there is no silver bullet reform to tackle corruption. We can't go and say there is this one great thing we can do and, and, and then we, 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 we can do that. We have heard directly from country reformers about different policy areas that we need to see greater ambition on. And I really hope some of the speakers after this, and I know Helen Derbyshire will probably touch on, um, uh, uh, what is the kind of bouquet of reforms we need to look at to tackle the multifaceted uh, issue that corruption is. Now, this is where there is an opportunity for leadership from a few countries uh, to share more of what you have been doing in your own domestic reform agenda and ensure that there is a coalition of the willing that steps up collective ambition at UNGAS. Um, uh, Alejandro Alvarez touched on this too. Corruption is really not a new problem before the pandemic hit and has always been a key factor and breaking down public trust. And even before the pandemic, um, corruption was at an all-time high, and you know, we have various indices that point to that, but we were witnessing some slow, gradual progress um, on reforms that contribute to the wider governance agenda. You know, over 100 countries had developed legal frameworks on access to information, though as many will tell you, including after me, that there are, uh, you know, there are various degrees of ambition. The open budget survey had found uh, steady progress on budget transparency, and then more countries were looking at open public procurement. Uh, and of course, there was the commitment to sustainable development goals, but we saw uh, really a tremendous low back, uh, rollback after the pandemic on several of this. So we're starting from even a, further, a, a position that's further back than we were uh, before the pan, uh, pandemic in some ways. Even among the members of the Open Government Partnership, uh, a multilateral, multi-stakeholder partnership of 78 countries, several of your countries are members, we are seeing some of these setbacks. Uh, now, one of the things that we saw that, um, again, that was highlighted yesterday, is that corruption is one of the most significant challenges um, that is affecting any kind of open response or open recovery um, and affecting efforts to save lives and livelihoods. Uh, there have been multiple scandals across countries in the global north and south. So this is not corruption is not just a developing country problem. Open contracting processes were circumvented to save time, which saw emergency procurement funds being diverted life-saving medical equipment not being delivered or ending up faulty. And now we have the same, same kind of conversations when it comes to design, procurement, and, and, and dissemination of vaccines. 
Um, I was really um, glad to hear uh, Ambassador Moon talk about the open, the importance of uh, being open and sharing information uh, about uh, COVID, about disaster management, about pandemic recovery, because they are essential to social justice and protecting democracy. Now, um, the, the, the key aspects on raising the bar, um, there are several issues that other, others have covered, but I do want to touch on, I think, money laundering and illicit final, financial flows is a big one. We know money laundering fuels criminal activities, drains money from public coffers that fund essential public services like healthcare, education, and exacerbates inequalities. Um, and we also have seen recently it funnels dark money into disinformation campaigns and really destabilizes electoral processes. We've seen countries yesterday like Nigeria who are making progress on this, including through their open government partnership uh, action plans. We've also seen that not just beneficial ownership, but there is a larger anti-corruption ecosystem uh, that needs to be looked at. We need to ensure that there are adequate oversight mechanisms, uh, safeguards to protect data reporting. Um, and we also need to ensure that there are legal frameworks on asset recovery, conflict of interest, along with whistleblower protection laws to protect those who uncover systemic corruption. So these are all areas and uh, more will follow that others will talk about that UNGAS and other forums need to address. And we need to strive not just for the lowest common denominator, but to raise the bar. Second, um, 2021, we all recognize as an important moment, but there is need to build a shared roadmap for collective action. And I'm really glad Alfredo Durante from the government of Italy highlighted that this is something they're looking to do through their G20 presidency. The risk is that a lot of these summits are often just talk, end up as talking shops with really warm worded, worded communiques, but very little follow through at the country level. And the opportunity this year is really to create momentum through renewed multilateralism on democracy and corruption that looks at real tangible commitments at the country level that benefits citizens for year to come. So most prominently, and you laid these out, Lee, there is the UNGAS, there is the FACTI panel, there is the OECD forum um, later this month, all the way up to the OGP summit in December. Now, across all of these summits, there must be spaces for civil society and non-government actors to work in partnership with governments to really make this reality and bridge uh, it to country level action. And it is important that these forums show uh, how this um, uh, can also track implementation. And so where we can look at ways to ensure some kind of a follow through mechanism, and many countries do this through their OGP action plans, but I'm sure there are others that people can think of, it is important that those are embedded in the UNGAS conversations. And for instance, following the 2016 London Anti-Corruption Summit, several OGP members implemented their summit commitments through OGP action plans, co-creating these policies with civil society. So we hope that many countries here are thinking about not just UNGAS, but follow through at the country level. Finally, the wider ecosystem outside the states that preserves government accountability saw the most worrying trends after the pandemic. Several governments use the pandemic as a route for restricting space for civil society and underrepresented communities and curbing media freedom. As of end of last year, many months after the pandemic first hit, about 10 countries continued to restrict media, media freedom. And I commend the point that Ambassador Moon made for raising the issue of how extended emergency measures, often without due process, can be misused for silencing the public, often when they speak out against corruption. So we need to form, 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 forge stronger cross-sector coalitions, civil society, private sector government to really look at follow through. So in conclusion, what do we need to do? We need to, A, I think, look at cross-sector coalitions in ways that we can follow through from global commitments to country action. Two, we need to make sure we figure out how to track and measure progress. And three, we need to raise the bar. We need to look at solid progress and and on concrete policy areas at UNGAS and beyond um, and build a shared roadmap across all the forums. Thanks, Lee, back to you. Thank you very much. We're running a little bit late, so we're gonna gather up questions and, and address them later in the program. But uh, with those words, raising the bar golden year of anti-corruption work, I'm handing it over to Karina to moderate the next session in order to take all of this forward. Please, Karina. 
Good morning. Thank you, Liv. Um, I'm Karina Gerlach, and I am a senior advisor at CIC and to the Pathfinders. Um, wonderful to see you all. Thanks for being here. And without uh, further ado, we're going to move on to actually um, the UNGAS portion, <laughs> the one that we've been talking about yesterday and today, and we'll now hear from some people who are very involved in the actual process. Uh, first, uh, we'll be hearing from the De Deputy Permanent Representative of Peru, um, Luis Ugarelli. As you know, Peru and UAE are the co-facilitators of the UNGAS political declaration. Um, so Luis Ugarelli will give us uh, uh, a briefing on what's happening in Vienna um, and will be followed by the Secretariat view of this. And it will be Bridget Strobel Shaw, who's the chief of the corruption and economic crime branch at UNODC that is accompanying member states in this journey to reach this political declaration. And then Helen Darbyshire, Executive Director of Access Info Europe and Chair of the UNCAC Coalition to get um, the civil society perspective on what's happening in Vienna. Luis, um, the floor is yours. Bienvenido, Luis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karina. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking the invitation to this important event focus on providing an overview of the path being forced on the occasion of the next UNGAS, as well as on the current progress in the fight against corruption. Corruption is a phenomenon that affects dem democratic governance, economic growth, public trust in institutions, and people's rights manifesting itself in different ways in the social, political, and economic scenarios. In that regard, its implications are a concern not only to governments, but also to the private sector and civil society. Based on these premises, during 2018, Colombia and Peru decided to join forces to convene a United Nations Special General Assembly on the fight against corruption in order to renew the political commitment of all countries and strengthen their cooperation in the fight against this scourge and its international scope. After 15 years of existence, the UNCAC has been very useful and continues to be the main universal instrument in the fight against corruption. However, this utility has been also been surpassed by the constant evolution of the crime of corruption. States need to strengthen their strategic alliances, including with the private sector and civil society to face this scourge, proposing solutions, defining directions, and developing strategies with a view to consolidating a broad-based political commitment and unity. The UNGAS offers an opportunity to achieve these ambitions through its political declaration which should be an action-oriented document with clear and concrete mandates. Indeed, this special session must amplify the call to all governments and other stakeholders to renew our commitments at the highest level, strengthen our cooperation, update the current legal framework, if necessary, and deepen and improve existing mechanisms to prevent and sanction corruption based on transparency and tangible actions and results. Taking the UNCAC as a cornerstone in the fight against corruption, the political declaration that is being negotiated in Vienna follows and respects its structure and has specific sections on prevention, asset recovery, technical assistance, criminalization, and international cooperation. In addition, a segment has been dedicated to adopting measures that promote compliance with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, considering the impact that corruption has on the social and economic development of the countries. The negotiating process has been very broad and almost all countries are expressing their views on this phenomenon that affects every single person in the world. Several cross-cutting issues like the participation of civil society, gender, and transparency are being discussed throughout the document. In addition, main areas like asset recovery, 
and international cooperation are being subject to intense exchange of points of view that I'm sure will result in a comprehensive text generated by consensus. We consider of particular importance the segment on promoting an, an anti-corruption framework with a vision for the future, for its innovative ideas and proposals aimed to improve the response of the international community, including the role of the United Nations. This, the premise is clear. Since the establishment of the UNCAC 15 years ago, corruption has advanced in an alarming rate, broadening its use of new technologies and modalities that were not contemplated in this instrument, such as precision, direct information exchange, and the responsibility of international officials, among others. In that regard, Peru considers necessary and timely to establish an intergovernmental process which can benefit from the support and experience of national experts representing all regions to identify gaps and undertake a through evaluation of the convention. While noting the concerns and sensitivities of some countries, we believe the outcome of these deliberations will set the basis of policy proposals to improve, strengthen, and or complement the convention to be submitted and discussed at the conference of the parties. For this reason, we believe that the UNGAS can contribute to strengthening UNCAC's role, addressing its gaps, and renewing our national and collective commitments to prevent and fight corruption and tackle its harmful effects on the achievement of the SDGs already impacted by the current pandemic. I thank you very much. Thank you, muchas gracias, Luis. Um, I think that one of the things that most struck you, like the, uh, in the previous section, we had the golden uh, opportunity, uh, the 2021 as the golden year of opportunity. This, what struck me from your um, introductory remarks was the constant evolution of the crime of corruption and how that has, uh, that went through your whole statement and what um, UNGAS and the delegations in Vienna need to rise to the challenge to deal with this constant evolution and what has happened over the last 15 years. Um, could I ask now um, Bridget um, to give the perspective uh, from the UN Secretariat in Geneva, UNODC Secretariat that's accompanying delegations in this journey. The floor is yours, Bridget. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having us here. I want to um, describe the two parallel processes that are happening and in the in the second part probably built on what was mentioned by Peru in terms of the negotiations of the political declaration. In parallel to this uh, member states negotiations, we also have held um, three intersessional meetings in preparation for the UNGAS, which have been open to um, civil society organizations, other international organizations and member states. Um, Alfredo Durante mentioned um, before his participation in the last me meeting that took place two weeks ago. Um, the, the meetings had a thematic focus and panel discussions on a variety of issues from prevention and criminalization in September, international cooperation and asset recovery in December, and the meeting that took place two weeks ago in Vienna um, focused really on the way forward in fighting corruption 15 years after the entry into force of the UN Convention Against Corruption, beneficial ownership transparency and the role of the private sector in combating corruption was on the agenda, measures to address impunity, including by strengthening the role of the judiciary oversight bodies and the potential of education and technology in preventing and combating corruption. The outcome documents are available on our UNGAS um, 2021 website, and I thank Paula for putting that into the chat already. So as already mentioned by Peru, the outcome of the UNGAS is to be a concise and action-oriented political declaration, which is uh, at the moment being negotiated under the auspices of the Conference of States Parties in Vienna. We have received um, contributions from over 50 states parties, international organizations, and CSOs, academia, and the private sector um, to inspire and feed into the drafting process. They are all available on the website for anybody who is interested to, to learn more, more about what the views of the different stakeholders are. 
Um, of course, we still welcome submissions. So if there's anybody on the call who would still like to, to provide submissions for the UNGAS 2021, then we are happy to post that also on our website. Um, we've heard that um, the delegations are working on the political declaration under the leadership of the ambassadors from the UAE and Peru in Vienna. And the de declaration is currently in its second reading, which is almost concluded. And there has been a, a strong cooperative spirit. Um, the issues addressed in the draft political declaration cover a wide range of measures. And, uh, and Peru has outlined already more or less the structure of the, of, um, the declaration. I would like to go maybe a bit more into detail on the on the topics. So in terms of preventive measures, um, there's of course focus on um, prevention strategies, anti-corruption, the role of anti-corruption and oversight bodies, um, beneficial ownership uh, transparency, an issue which I understand that you have also discussed yesterday in detail is, um, is quite prominent in the, in the draft anti-corruption measures in the private sector and access to information and effective and inclusive participation of all stakeholders are also covered. There's also the topics of the role of parliamentarians or other legislative bodies in, in corruption, but um, in fighting corruption and the role of oversight institutions such as supreme audit institutions the integrity of the financial system and the role of anti-corruption measures for international investments are other topics that are covered under the prevention chapter. There's also, in, in the chapter of criminalization, there's strong focus on, um, on criminalize, criminalizing and enforcing corruption um, legislation to end impunity. There are measures um, including improving capacity of law enforcement agencies or effective cooperation and information exchange between the relevant agencies are highlighted. Delegations are also discussing the need for a safe and enabling environment and protection measures for those involved in uncovering and enforcing corruption offenses, such as whistleblower protection, the protection of reporting persons, witnesses, investigators and prosecutors. Not surprisingly, international cooperation and asset recovery are topics high on the agenda and are thus negotiated intensively. One focus of the discussions is how to make these processes of international cooperation in corruption cases more efficient and less burdensome by using and strengthening legal frameworks and regional international and um, interregional networks and using flexible instruments for mutual legal assistance, such as non-conviction based confiscation, as well as by simplifying procedures to improve efficiency. Um, these discussions also cover technical assistance and the importance of technical assistance and information sharing, as well as cross-cutting issues, such as the use of new technologies, the link between corruption and other forms of crime, and the need for sound methodologies to better measure corruption, which we've heard from Alfredo Durante is also a priority for the, for the G20 presidency this year. When it comes to the forward-looking agenda, there's consensus that more needs to be done to combat corruption more effectively, as over 15 years after the UNCAC entered into force, corruption still thrives. As for how to move forward, there are two aspects to this. One is to create some form of new, additional, innovative mechanism, tool or instrument that would supplement the existing architecture to fully address the challenges states are facing. And here again, we heard from Peru what their vision is for, for this um, new mechanism. Another aspect relates to the need to comprehensively implement the existing architecture. The peer reviews from the UNCAC implementation review mechanism, for example, have resulted in over 7,000 recommendation uh, recommendations across 170 countries. Specifically, delegations have highlighted that over 500 recommendations alone have been issued regarding the criminalization of bribery of national and foreign public officials, one of the most basic and quintessential provisions in the convention. There's thus a strong argument that these gaps need to be urgently addressed domestically and will not be fixed to a new instrument. For anyone who's interested, I encourage you again to read the submissions on our website. And as for the next step, the Conference of the States Parties is scheduled to approve the political declaration in May, on the 7th of May, and subsequently transmit it to the General Assembly, where the special session will adopt it, hopefully on 2 to 4 more May. Uh, two to four June, sorry. So with that, I thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Bridget. Um, you certainly um, outlined the huge scope of this endeavor and all of the work that you and the delegations have ahead of you um, before the 7th of May. Um, let's um, move on now to Helen Derbyshire to hear from the, the civil society perspective on what's happening in Vienna. And then following that, we will take a number of questions that have been posed. Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karina, and uh, hello from Madrid, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here wearing three hats uh, as uh, the Executive Director of Access Info, but also, as has been said, as a member of the Steering Committee of OJP and as Chair of the Civil Society Coalition that has been working to promote implementation of the UNCAC anti-corruption mechanisms, the UNCAC Coalition was called. Uh, there are over 300 organizations in this coalition, and we're working also, many of them are also engaged in working at the national level on open government partnership action plans. And, and we have been able to have, engage in the discussions related to the UNGAS, and many organizations have put forward recommendations for the, in the consultation on the political declaration. We've already heard uh, yesterday and today a lot of really excellent presentations on the priority issues that we need to address. And we've heard how the pandemic has brought many of these into sharp relief. Uh, we know that, for example, we've seen that we don't have strong enough rules on transparency of public procurement. We don't yet have open company registers in many countries. The title of this session right now is how to how the UNGAS can move forward the UN's anti-corruption efforts. I would say that they're the global community, the, 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 the global anti-corruption efforts that we're all trying to work collectively on. The it's from civil society's perspective, we do have priorities as to the uh, specific commitments which should be included in the UNGAS political declaration. Uh, Company registers keeps being mentioned at the risk of being repetitive. I'll run through the list again. Um, come open company registers, open beneficial ownership, full transparency of public procurement, uh, great, greater transparency and mechanisms to tackle illicit financial reflow, flows. We've got the factory panel's recommendations. Um, the return of stolen assets uh, so that we can actually use them to finance the SDGs making the connection there between our anti-corruption efforts and advancing with the SDGs is very important. Tax transparency, how do we actually uh, address tax evasion and avoidance and again, ensure that uh, that doesn't take money out of development and advancing on the SDGs. Uh, we need stronger sanctions for those uh, who facilitate financial crime. We, we, many countries, as has been mentioned, have access to information laws, but they're not yet strongly implemented, and many of them lack independent oversight mechanisms. And we still need countries to commit to protection of whistleblowers, and we need protection of investigative journalists. So we have a good list of what the issues are. And the question really is, how do we ensure that we uh, act on, on these uh, to, to advance on many of these. Um, and I think here what we're really talking about, one thing is the technical solutions, but the other thing is how we generate political will. Uh, and that is what the UNGAS is about, as well as the technicalities of the specific commitments. Because we, we've, we've listed in the UNCAC many things that states have to do, and yet uh, it is not, the implementation has not yet fully been achieved. I would say that we have two levels. One is implementing the UNCAC and getting the political declaration that contain concrete commitments which will help us move forward with doing that. And at the same time, as many of the speakers we've heard yesterday and today have mentioned, the UNCAC is a foundational instrument. And we've since identified the need for supplementary instruments, new instruments. And as we've heard, the nature of corruption has evolved during the last 15 years. So there's this UNCAC level and there's the beyond UNCAC level. The UNGAS we can, I believe, see as a milestone 
event which helps us move forward uh, at both those levels. We can use the political direct the, the declaration, but we can also use the debates around the UNCAC to work to bring together, as Tonu Vasu of OGP suggested, this coalition of the willing uh, that is really committed, the countries that are really committed to moving the global anti-corruption agenda forward. And here I think we can use the UNGAS to make connections between the multiple processes that we have going on globally. We have in particular, the work being done by the Open Government Partnership, as we've heard during these sessions. And the OGP is unique because governments work hand in hand with civil society to identify and agree priorities and to define, co define concrete measurable actions to strengthen national anti-corruption frameworks. There are things that we need to do here. As Alfredo Durante from the Italian government said, we need to both measure and advance on beneficial ownership transparency. And I would signal here that we're currently seeing a pushback against open company registers from some EU member states in debates taking place right now in the European Commission. Some leadership from, the, from Italy on this would be very helpful. We also have processes like the OECD's Transparency and Accountability Network, which was launched just last month. And the work that UNESCO is doing to measure transparency through measurement of SDG indicator 16.10.2 on the right of access to information. I'd like to finish by stressing the really important role of civil society. As we've seen, as we've heard during the, the, these two days, there are organizations which are the leading actors in defining and advancing both standards and implementation of those standards, the Open Contracting Partnership, Open Ownership, Access Info's work on the right of access to information, Transparency International, and of course, all 300 members of the UNCAP coalition, many of them working at the national level. We do have processes such as OGP, where civil society is very much in the tape, at the table and engaged. But regrettably, there are other processes where civil society's valuable role is not fully recognized. And I would say that there is some resistance to civil society engagement in the UNCAC processes. And there is clear pressure on civic space. And in, in some of the UNCAC processes, there are attempts by some countries to exclude certain civil society organizations to prevent their voices being heard. So that is something that the community of the willing, again, to pick up Tonu's terminology there, which I very much support, as we move forward in the discussions around UNCAC, uh, UNGAS and beyond to these other important events in 2021 and beyond, it's very important that civil society actors are fully included because we do have much to contribute if we're going to, and if we're going to combat corruption, civil society has to be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. <clears throat> Um, before we take in um, some questions that we have gotten from the floor, I would just like, um, well, first of all, to thank you for that intervention about uh, what, the civil, what civil society is doing and where it is um, managing to get its voice heard and where not, and where we have to remain vigilant about that civic space. Um, I would like to ask um, either Helen or Luis Ugarelli uh, just a follow-up question because it's come up in the chat, and that is, I think you both both mentioned that one of the proposals and that Peru was was advocating for a new follow-up mechanism uh, uh, in Ungas. Um, could you just be uh, could you just give us a short explanation again uh, to clarify what that is, what what the request is? Luis, maybe. And what is the format that's being proposed? Yes, hi, Karina. Um, well, re regarding uh, what what are the, the the subject we are dealing with here today, I think uh, the, the the important aspect is that this is a let's say a golden opportunity in the multilateral system to uh, tackle this uh, 
so important subject in the international agenda. Now, with the pandemic, it also has more relevance than ever. We are, we are two months away of the, the, the UNGAS, UNGAS meeting, and I think the, the, the states have uh, made the, the very strong commitments to advance in the most possible way. So we have to be uh, uh, respectful of the views or sensitivities of the of the countries on on this, and 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 the thing is, change has been made since uh, the UNCAC 15 years ago. So the proposal was uh, on that direction. What are the the things that we can uh, explore on on that regard? So I I would leave it I would leave it there. And maybe uh, maybe uh, our uh, friend from from UNODC, this is in Vienna. Maybe has some some details that could be useful for for the people uh, in this meeting today. I thank you, Karina. Thank you, Luis. Uh, Bridget, um, could you complement that, please? Sure. Thank you for Helen to, to, to take the floor first, but I see there's this question, what are the main issues being resisted on by UN member states, and I don't think there are any main issues. I think the member states try to seek more clarity on some of the proposals that have been made on, on new instruments and how, um, how those could be implemented, and there's, of course, also from some member states really the desire to implement first what we have before we distract or to at least also implement what we have before we distract attention by creating new instruments so i think this is a bit the the the, the situation we find ourselves in now but I, I want to really stress that there is goodwill and and we have seen a lot of goodwill from member states to move forward with uh, with commitment and and to make ungas um, count if you so wish Thank you very much. I understand um, that Helen would like to uh, complement that as well. Yes, thank you, Karina. Very briefly, um, a civil society was certainly in favor of follow-up mechanisms um, with two objectives at least. One is to really moving beyond UNGAS to decide how we move on the political declaration and implement it. So a forum in which we can discuss really practical solutions. And the second is we do believe that we need a frank discussion about what gaps there are and what additional mechanisms or instruments. And I think that such a forum would also provide a, um, opportunity and space for connection with other initiatives that are taking place to ensure that we have joined up solutions to addressing the many challenges that we still face in combating corruption. Thank you. Um, thank you, Helen. And I think that what I, what I think that a lot of people would like to hear, however, is that what, what would be the timelines on all of these things? Because people are asking for urgent solutions. And if um, the UNGAS was to sort of come up with a declaration which calls for further talking and for further negotiation, um, I think it would be um, a little bit difficult for quite a few people to stomach. So I'm just wondering if anybody could speak to that um, in terms of timelines in terms of the roadmap that Tono was talking about? Uh, how do we move forward and what would be the concrete actions? Does this not need to be a continuous uh, process? I think we, it can be a bit, we have these milestone moments. The question is having actions between those big events as well. One of the things that I really like about OGP is that, I mean, there is a forum, a, a global summit coming up, but it's been two years since the last one. There is a lot, a lot of activity that takes place between the big summits. And I think perhaps we could strengthen some of those processes. It, this is urgent. If we really believe that it's urgent, let's put effort into this now. Thank you, Helen. Um, we have um, Anna Koppel from IDLO, the International Development Law Organization, who's been asking for the floor. Um, could I give her the floor, please? Thank you very much. Anna. Welcome, Anna. 
Thank you so much. Hello, uh, distinguished panelists and organizers. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to take the floor and uh, note that IDLO would firstly like to congratulate uh, the Pathfinders and the Open Government Partnership for shining a light on this very important issue in a year which, as many speakers have already noted, is a particularly important one for anti-corruption efforts. And indeed, the COVID-19 emergency and the heightened associated corruption risks that many of you have already mentioned bring these efforts into a particularly stark focus. I wanted to say just a few words on our own work in support of these important processes and offer another opportunity for collaboration. Um, as um, many of you probably know, IDLO has been and continues to be committed to making a practical contribution to the fight against corruption. And we do so programmatically by supporting our national partners in such efforts as the implementation of digital innovation technologies for enhancing judicial transparency, supporting integrity-based processes in the establishment of specialized anti-corruption bodies, and developing instruments that can help judiciaries assess the impact of COVID-19 on their independence and transparency, among many others. We've also been an active participant on the policy advocacy front, serving as an observer in the UN gas preparatory process, developing a research and policy publication on COVID-19 and the rule of law, and holding several crisis governance forums that bring together experts such as yourselves to discuss how to best tackle emerging challenges. And anti-corruption initiatives are an integral part of our new strategic plan, and anti-corruption will also be a key focus for this year's SDG 16 conference, which is co-organized with UN DESA and the government of Italy. It will be held online this year on the 28th through the 30th of April, and we would like to invite you all to join us in the discussion of how SDG 16 can be a roadmap for the global recovery by helping to renew the social contract and rebuild trust between people and state. The event will also include the issue of the integrity of the judiciary specifically and look at whether a new vision of transformative governance can be used to overcome the societal fragilities that the pandemic has brought so starkly to light. So we look forward to continuing to work with all of you and to support the important processes unfolding this year and beyond, including under the G20 umbrella, the UNGAS process and other initiatives to ensure continued policy momentum to turn the political declaration into concrete action on the ground. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Lana. Um, we in Pathfinders work very closely with uh, IDLO and we look forward to collaborating on the SDG 16 conference. Um, I'm just wondering if we have um, any additional questions. We have a, um, a question from an anonymous attendee in, 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 in the chat box and that is, if you could just point out what are the main issues being resisted by member states in order to go beyond the current discussions on Hungas and how could we overcome that? Does anybody um, feel that they can take on that question or would like to comment on it? None of our panelists? Could you repeat the question because I can't see it in the chat. Okay. It's in the question and answer. In your view, what are the main issues being resisted by UN member states in order to go beyond the current discussions on UNGAS? And how can we overcome them? Um, well, briefly, I think that, you know, that there's this sort of slight tension between whether we have, um, we, we actually work on new instruments, such as the faculty panel has recommended. I, in civil society, I think we believe very strongly that we do need to strengthen the instruments. And as a couple of the speakers, including a colleague from the Italian government said, it's 15 years since the UNCAC was uh, developed and corruption itself has evolved. Um, the anti-corruption movement needs to be ready to be as agile um, and responsive as the corrupt are to the systems we put in place. I think that's terribly important to, to actually have a discussion about those gaps and to be ready to consider new instruments on asset recovery, on tax evasion. Uh, it's, it's, those are the kinds of things I think that we would see. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Helen. I don't know whether Bridget or Luis would like to follow up on any of this. Uh, yes, uh, Karina. Yes, Luis, your floor is yours. Yes, just uh, very, very briefly. Uh, I think it is important to highlight that uh, this is uh, the, the political declaration is, is just not to renew our political commitment. 
that was uh, made uh, 15 years ago with, with UNCAC, but also uh, strengthen international cooperation, especially to deal with these uh, new challenges that have arisen in, the, in, in this uh, 15 years. So, but as any process of negotiation, we have to be uh, uh, aware that there are maybe some, uh, some sensitivities. And of course, in, in, in every process, you have to deal with that. And we hope we arise to a strong political declaration at, at the end and, and, and send a clear message so that the commitment of states are uh, the fight against and tackle corruption as the, the course that is to, to the society in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bridget, would you like to add anything to that before we go on to the next segment? Thank you, Karina. I think I, I, that's what I tried to mention before. I think there is, I think more the serious um, desire by member states to understand the new mechanisms or instruments that are proposed. I don't see any member state um, outright uh, refusing, but I think there needs to be more clarity what it is that we're trying to establish or that member states are trying to establish. So I think there is a, is a lot of goodwill, but I think there's still quite some, quite some way to go to fully grasp what, what we have in mind in terms of the more forward-looking innovative ideas that are now being discussed as part of the political declaration. Thank you so much, Bridget. I think um, we'll have an opportunity towards the end of the meeting uh, for more questions and for more commentary from the floor. And hopefully we'll hear from some of our member states as well. Um, but I'd like to turn now to my colleague, Faiza Shaheen, who's the program lead on inequality and exclusion here at Pathfinders. For those of you who don't know, or maybe don't know, um, Pathfinders is a coalition, a platform of governments and international organizations that are dedicated to accelerating the implementation of SDG 16. We have we work on three grand challenges, and one of them, one on justice, one on housing violence, and the other is on inequality and exclusion, where obviously um, corruption uh, plays a big role in that in that grand challenge. And therefore, Faizi Shaheen is going to take up um, the issue here in the context of that grand challenge. Over to you, Faiza. Many thanks, Karina. Um, and it's it's been amazing to listen to esteemed speakers and friends over the last couple of days. It's very hard to follow and come at the end. I'm really going to focus on where we can really raise the ambition going forward. But before that, I, over the last couple of days, a story, a, a situation has really been playing on my mind. And that is last year I was interviewing some care workers and um, one of them had, had had a horrific time whereby she wasn't given proper personal protective equipment and um, people had become infected in the, in the care home in which she was working in and ultimately one died. She also took a <coughs> COVID virus back to her own home um, where people got sick in her own family. And the very next day, um, after I'd spoken to her about her horrific story, uh, there was a story in the newspapers about uh, government corruption, essentially whereby a contract had been given to a company that had never made uh, personal protective equipment um, before. And I think it's really important for us, I'm a policy person and an economist, but I think it's really important for us to always humanize um, the corruption and the impact it's having on people. So let me just talk about, just go through a little bit about what we've heard over the last um, couple of days. And we've heard about so many tools, um, whether it be beneficial ownership about open contracting partnership yesterday, um, opportunities for technology um, and the need for machine readable data. Um, and today from Ambassador Moon on the conflict of interest code. Um, you know, all of this to me highlights um, these common principles of transparency, of sharing within and between countries, of openness, of empowering the public and civil society. You know, that was really a thread that has run through the last couple of days of discussions. Um, and it, the list, the long list of ways in which we can address issues of corruption is a reminder that the issue here doesn't seem to be one of a lack of policy ideas. Um, in terms of um, where we go from here, and 
I think for those of us that have worked on corruption and particularly I've worked on tax issues for some time, you know, we can really trace some clear wins. Um, you know, since the financial global financial, uh, the global financial crisis, several new global transparency initiatives have popped up and the OECD has been key to efforts. Um, and, you know, civil society has really pushed on this issue, but there is a painful truth and a few, a few people, a few of the speakers today have alluded to it and spoken about it that, you know, in many countries, despite these efforts, the tax gap is increasing and the global pandemic has meant more, not less cases of government corruption all over the world, whether it be high, middle or low income countries. Um, and, you know, for us, the reality is that those who seek to hide money and engage in other forms of corruption are redoubling their efforts just as we are redoubling our efforts to address the issues. So we must constantly be raising our expectations and aspirations even higher. So on this, and I'm very lucky to, to be a, a, to work with Karina and Sarah and Leave and others on the policy solutions. Um, and, and we at the Grand Challenge have been thinking about what we do on, on corruption and specifically on tax um, as part of an effort to address inequality and exclusion. Um, and, you know, there, there are actions that individual countries can take, and we've heard about that over the last couple of days, but even with all of the will in the world, they cannot do this on their own. Um, and a lack of coordinated global action to stem illicit financial flows undermines um, the post-COVID-19 recovery, as well as our longer term commitment to the sustainable development goals. Um, so one of the ideas that has struck us and that we've been thinking about to raise uh, the ambition here is a global asset re registry. And this was originally proposed uh, by the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation a couple of years ago. Now, an establishment of a global asset registry would provide a database of companies, properties, valuable goods and other assets, along with a list of their real owners, um, and it would go a long way to fight in corruption, tax evasion, uh, and addressing issues of money laundering and dirty money movement uh, around the world. Around, around the world. Um, look, a lot of countries already have some form of asset registry, and uh, and and we can really make a start on this. Um, you know, it's a, a global registry. Uh, we don't have we have individual uh, registries, but not a global registry to address transnational corruption and, and to facilitate the international cooperation and asset recovery. Now, an, a global asset registry would also ensure transparency and access to information, which are the key pillars of anti-corruption strategies. It will diminish opportunities to keep corrupt arrangements secret, um, and it would allow monitoring institutions and other actors to have the necessary information to prevent corruption and, and abuses of power. Um, it's really a major way in which we can close the loopholes um, and join the dots between the individual country actions that are taking place. So there are questions about how this would work precisely, um, but we, like the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation, propose a trial, um, and starting with the wealthier countries that have the financial and techno uh, technological capacity, uh, perhaps the EU, um, with a discussion about what assets we can include um, in the first tranche. Um, and there is a big added bonus of a global ad uh, asset registry from, from the perspective of, of someone that's worked on inequality in it, uh, for a long time is that it will allow us to really highlight issues of wealth inequality and to measure issues of wealth inequality, to facilitate well-informed public and policymaker discussions on the desired degree of inequality, um, as well as taxation. Because right now we just don't have a good idea of how much wealth inequality we have um, because that money is hidden. And this is a bridge to my final point really. Um, you know, I wanna, really make the link back to inequality. Um, there was uh, a colleague from Afghanistan yesterday who asked how to address the root causes of corruption. And um, I just want to remind everyone and, and pull out this relationship between corruption and inequality, which doesn't, which doesn't just go one way. It's not just more corruption means more inequality. There is ample evidence to show that more inequality also leads to more 
corruption. Um, in more unequal countries, the elites are likely to both have greater motivation and opportunities to engage in bribery and fraud um, as means to preserve and advance their own status and privileges. Um, while the interests of the poor, um, as they're more vulnerable, it's easier to extort them um, and harder for them to take action. So to this end, um, you know, we're really thinking about this global asset registry and efforts to address corruption in a broader scheme of efforts uh, and policies to address inequality. So just to plug some of the work that we're doing, we have a policy matrix um, that um, you can have a look at and, and provides a menu of options on inequality. Um, and we are also thinking about um, how we build the, uh, the political will and we're also thinking about how we might sequence efforts to bring in um, new taxes and to address um, issues of uh, tax evasion um, by how we message this to the public um, and and again you know the other side of the equation how the money is being spent how progressive has or pro poor has COVID spending been so these are the things that we'll be doing um, going ahead. So looking at what we can do on corruption, but really trying to map that across a broader effort to address inequality. So let me leave it there and just say, as we redouble our efforts to address corruption, we must also redouble our efforts to address inequality so that we're not always chasing our tail on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Faiza. Uh, for that presentation, uh, Paola has uh, kindly put into the chat box the matrix uh, on inequality and exclusion, the policy matrix. So um, it is available to all of you. And I would like to now open uh, the floor to any questions or any interventions um, by member states. Um, is there anyone who would like to take the floor? Okay, I have, I can't, who is it that's asking for the floor, Paula? Okay. <clears throat> um, Katia Villarreal has asked for the floor. Could you kindly identify yourself? Um, hello, good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. It's a bit odd that uh, that Villarreal's name uh, was uh, there. That oh, it's Bruno. I... Bienvenido, Bruno. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Karina, and uh, all the Pathfinders and uh, OGP for uh, convening us today. Uh, my name is Bruno Rios. I am from the permanent mission of uh, Mexico. And uh, we are really welcome this uh, very timely and uh, informative event. Uh, this is uh, really important to give member states uh, a glimpse of the key issues uh, surrounding the uh, special session on, on corruption to, to take place uh, in June this year. Um, as has been uh, mentioned by the panelists uh, through these couple of days, uh, we uh, really believe that this is uh, an outstanding opportunity uh, for uh, international community and for uh, multilateral discussions in the UN setting uh, to advance the global efforts uh, to bring uh, coherence uh, uh, to our uh, anti-corruption efforts uh, as a key issue. Um, with uh, challenges posed by uh, the pandemic and the real threat that it poses to public health, it's become uh, increasingly important to ensure that everyone has access to vaccines, medicines, and treatments to uh, combat COVID-19. And uh, in here, we believe that uh, the UN plays a role of efficiency and unity to guarantee access uh, to all. Uh, and it uh, demonstrates uh, the importance of uh, having strong settings, uh, multilateral in nature, in order to fight against any uh, possible wrongdoing uh, as uh, we provide uh, vaccines to, to everyone. 
uh, it is uh, our belief uh, that with this special session, we must go beyond uh, what a regular uh, meeting of the state's parties uh, to long uh would uh, be deciding. Uh, in the General Assembly, we have a uh, universal membership. We have uh, the highest political deliberative body uh, here in New York. And that I, is why we uh, encourage everyone to uh, get involved in the discussions. We, we know that uh, uh, they are quite advanced at, the, at this point in, uh, in Vienna and uh, our delegation has been quite active uh, there. Uh, but as we come to uh, the conclusion of, of it, we uh, encourage everyone uh, to, to move forward. We encourage civil society to remain active and to uh, keep uh, presenting to, to member states uh, their concerns, they, what they see as uh, the shortcomings still are. And uh, we believe that uh, through these actions is that we will have uh, a successful meeting here in New York in June. It should be, again, more than just a great opportunity for speeches and uh, side events, important as they are, but really to, to have a, an outcome that uh, outlines uh, our ongoing and future efforts uh, against corruption. Uh, we uh, really uh, are very supportive of uh, the co-chairs uh, Peru and the UAE, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, we believe that uh, the most multi-stakeholder component of it uh, can be strengthened, particularly in this uh, uh, setting here in, in New York. Uh, we believe also that uh, we must not lose uh, sight of uh, uh, integrating it with the 2030 agenda and the SDG 16 uh, as, as part of it. Uh, and that by those efforts, uh, all of our societies will be well served. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Muchas gracias, Bruno. Um, uh, Mexico has been a great supporter of this agenda and uh, pushing us forward to do more. Um, I would like to give the floor now to Jose Ugas, um, former Secretary General of the uh, Transparency International, um, who many of us in this space know. Um, bienvenido, Jose. Jose? Jose, you're on mute. I, I understand that you're on mute, so we can't hear you. Okay, so we seem to have a we seem to have a technical glitch there with uh, Jose Ugas. Let me give the floor now to Ambassador Simi from um, the DPR Afghanistan, and then we'll come back to Jose Ugas, and hopefully by then we'll have figured out whatever the technical issue is. DPR of Afghanistan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and thank you for giving me the floor. In line of my points I made yesterday, I would like to highlight a couple of more points with your permission. Uh, while uh, corruption must be seen in a broader scope, as discussed by all panelists and the uh, speakers yesterday and today, uh, most importantly, uh, corruption uh, must be seen at the local level. Uh, there are a couple of important points at the local, local level is absolutely uh, the role of uh, justice, equality, and uh, good governance are the key issues. But beside that, most importantly, the role of corruption in organized crime is very important to be tackled and to be seen uh, uh, very uh, analytically. Uh, not only organized crime, the role of corruption in terrorism, 
and that most of the times the tourist uh, uh, using the corrupt uh, uh, practices uh, through different mechanisms. That was the reason I asked yesterday uh, from the panelists to focus on the root causes. The biggest concern and the biggest, one of the biggest uh, uh, concern is the corrupt appropriators protection and sheltering, which is one of the biggest concerns because we do have a lot of examples that the corrupt, the corrupt appropriators are leaving one area and choosing uh, protection and living in another area. So that is one of the important issues. Asset recovery and asset uh, transfer to the countries originated. Most importantly, uh, I would highlight uh, the point uh, that, the, that the corruption should be tackled collectively in, in, with its entirety, not only by the government, government, civil society, and all parts of the society. But most importantly, the people must be involved in fighting to the corruptions. And also regional cooperation is very important and effective in fighting the uh, corruption and corrupt, corrupt perpetrators. These are the points I just would like to highlight. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to my colleagues, Liv and Sarah, um, who will take over the rest of the question and answer and the summation of the meeting. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'll jump in first. Um, first, maybe to make you all aware that there was a question in the Q&A box to Alfredo Durante on civil society participation and tracking mechanisms, which he responded to. If you're interested, you can go to the Q&A box to see that. Then just briefly, we had suggestions for follow-up uh, processes afterwards. PR briefings, uh, we had the suggestions both yesterday and today. PR briefings, we should consider also probably summarizing the web seminar that we've now had over two days and with all the brilliant commitment suggestions and have that summary up on our website with hyperlinks and everything. So you can see all the, the great work as well as the debates that are now taking place. But before I hand it further over to, to Sarah, I'd like to actually ask Ambassador Moon uh, to see whether he got so shortcutted initially on time to see whether he's got anything to add, both on what he's been hearing up to now, as well as how Korea will take this forward. And then maybe have Alejandro come in with uh, some comments on all the great input that we've had during these couple of hours. Let me hand it first to Ambassador Moon. Okay, um, well, uh, instead of um, uh, make, uh, make uh, remarks on the pre prepared presentation, I would like to uh, make a brief uh, comment on today's discussion. Uh, actually, I'm very pleased and very happy to be here because um, I have a good chance to know more about UNGAS and the o, uh, OGP, uh, this great, great opportunity. Um, the first of all, I would like to um, suggest that, suggest that uh, regarding the objective measure, measurement of uh, corruption, uh, ACRC in Korea, have already 
more, uh, for more than decades, monitored and uh, assessed integrity level of government and the public institution, public businesses. So um, ACRC have a uh, uh, deep knowledge about how to measure integrity level objectively because whenever they assess the, the level, there's a lot of complaint from the uh, government and the uh, the uh, public institutions. So they uh, have uh, modified the measurement several times. So I think uh, next time the ACRC can uh, could uh, share their, their experience in terms of the objectivity of uh, measurement. Second uh, observation uh, is regarding the how to make government totally open. Uh, it, is, it is very easy to say that all, uh, government should be, should be totally open, but government uh, are very reluctant to uh, give the information which might uh, uh, cause the problems to, to the government and also the powerful powerful people do not want give information about themselves. So uh, the in international co uh, partnership uh, should be established to make government in the world uh, provide uh, disclose uh, uh, important information. Uh, so I suggest that um, how many uh, the uh, request from the civil society to the government. How many uh, 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 or the types of information or quantity or quality of information has been requested by the civil society and survey the whole uh, phenomena and then find out what kind of information uh, has been easily di uh, disclosed to the civil society and what kind of information uh, is hard to get. So then we can find a way to make government totally open. Um, and thirdly, as, 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 as I say that um, uh, one of the uh, flora, uh, one of the people at the flora say that the most corrupt people as the people who run the government, right? Is it? Is it? Uh, do you agree with that? Well, uh, sometimes I agree with that. But so um, the law enfor enforcing agency should be totally independent from the political power. Uh, so, but uh, since the most severe crime, uh, crimes are made at the top. So how how to how to uh, make uh, law enforcing agency uh, totally independent from the political power? It's very hard to uh, find a way to to deal with that problem, but we we have to find out. So that, that's all I um, uh, all my remarks on today's today's discussion. And uh, thank you, thank you very much. And I. I appreciate your your uh, presentation and remarks, uh, and so on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I had the, the pleasure of seeing some of the impressive work Korea is doing last year as well, and we are very much looking forward to seeing how Korea is going to take this forward um, in light of the co-chair of OGP, but also in the broader UNGAS setting. So thank you very, very much for those reflective comments. Now, can I ask Alejandro to come in and then maybe some concluding words from Tono before I hand it over to, to Sarah. Alejandro. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I actually don't have much more to say. Uh, you know, that, that was uh, already uh, said. Uh, I, I want to just repeat what I, uh, what I wanted to, uh, 
you know, what I said at the beginning, and, and I think that, you know, the conversation went in the direction that uh, everybody wanted. In, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to, to hear that there are some, uh, some discussions about a follow-up uh, mechanism. Um, I think that this is going to be uh, something interesting. Uh, you know, it might not, you know, fulfill the expectations of many, uh, but for sure, uh, it will, it, it will, it will at least open up a possibility to uh, to have further discussions. I, I, you know, I hope that those conversations are, or those mechanisms, you know, are, you know, broad enough uh, to 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 really uh, bring a new, uh, you know, fresh air to the conversation on anti-corruption. So, um, you know, I want to commend, uh, you know, the, the co-chairs of the negotiations and I want to encourage you, you know, to go as, as, as far as possible because uh, still, you know, from this perspective, uh, you know, I think the United Nations is an important actor uh, and we want to make sure that uh, we uh, have the instruments to help uh, member states to go as far as possible on these issues. I would say as well that we know we need to keep an, uh, you know, uh, uh, the eyes uh, open on what is going to happen, you know, this year and next year. Uh, you know, I take it with a little bit of skepticism on the golden year, uh, you know, statement to be honest, but I am so ready, you know, to be surprised. So let's hope that uh, you know that we are going on the you know on this direction and uh, again you know just encouragements for the co-chairs uh, for my colleagues uh, in UNODC uh, and for you know the civil society and we really hope that you know the story that we can convey to people that are waiting you know for uh, for us to take you know some uh, meaningful action you know will be you know good news and well received. Thank you. Thank you so much. We definitely take that challenge forward, Alejandro. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to be in close contact. Tonu, our great collaboration partner, OGP, closing reflection remarks before Sarah takes it forward towards the end. Tonu. Thanks, Levin. And I, I think um, where Alejandro stopped is maybe where I'll pick up is I think a lot of people are skeptical about this year, really. Of, of, of governments and countries uh, really taking up this opportunity. And I think this is a, a challenge that, uh, that a lot of uh, people in the room should take up. Um, I think there's a lot that's been said on the what, uh, but really looking at the UNGAS to set a, a high bar for some standards and, and, and intergovernmental partnership in action on this is important. Uh, but it is important to look beyond UNGAS and follow through. Of course, the OGP action plans is one way to do it, um, but domestically owned follow through is really, really critical. And I'm glad to hear that some of that conversation has started. Um, and finally, hopefully we'll see more of this dialogue and you know, uh, partners such as you at the Pathfinders are so, uh, have played such a fantastic role in bringing, bridging that UN um, New York conversation to a lot of the country conversations that we see. And we hope we can see a lot of national dialogue leading up to UNGAS and after and, and, and really creating that connective tissue all the way up to Korea in December at the OGP summit and beyond. So thank you and back to you. Thank you very much, Tana. And thanks also for great collaboration. Coalitions of the Willings, that's what we are building here um, every week, actually. Sarah, take it forward. Thank you very much, Liev, and thank you, colleagues uh, and panelists, for these concluding thoughts. So I have the very difficult task of trying to distill a few messages, not only from today's discussion, but also from yesterday's. We covered a lot of ground in that uh, period. And I'd like, first of all, to uh, thank all of those panelists who spoke yesterday and today, and also those who put comments and questions from the floor. I think this was a really energetic, intense, and uh, very, very productive discussion. I have uh, three categories, perhaps, of, uh, of things to look at in concluding. One is all the messages we got about why act now? What is the urgency of acting now? The second is how to build on the calendar of events this year. 
we do have a lot of opportunities in what is coming up this year and i think there are ways to link that were brought forward by different speakers yesterday and today and the third will be on the discussion we had today on the oil and gas itself and the possibilities for for action so first of all on why act i think we had three very clear messages come through here one was on popular demand so we see that in polls corruption is both very high in people's long-term priorities and rising up their priority list post covid it was of course dwarfed by the concerns over public health last year but we now see it is really rising up in the areas that people around the world want to to see action on the second is the immediate covid pressures that we see uh, and we know that there is a huge pressure for the vaccine rollout for more equitable access to medical technologies and for socioeconomic recovery programs but in all of those areas also comes the possibility of corruption so we have i think to show a delicate balance here of really being able to act quickly and disperse money quickly but do so in a way that maintains trust in the state and that means having effective controls against uh, corruption and the third point on why act now is the changing face of corruption many people made this this point among the speakers today that the situation we had 15 years ago when the UNCAC was agreed is no longer the face of corruption that we have today. We have deeper links with, with organized crime, we have deeper international networks, we have a, a different face and a different set of challenges that have to be dealt with, uh, more technological innovation. I think as uh, someone put it earlier, the corrupt actors are redoubling their efforts just as we redouble our efforts to address what they are doing and the international framework has to relate to that. So the second element I wanted to talk about in concluding is the series of events this year and some of the opportunities to build connections uh, between them. So one is between the UN as the most inclusive body of creating international frameworks uh, against corruption as well as normative standards. And I noted very much uh, what our uh, colleague from Italy, Alfredo, had said here about the taking in the past of agreements that are made at the UN and then taking those for action and further elaboration at the G20 or the OECD or other fora. So I think it's very important when we think about the UN processes this year to think that it can provide that inclusive framework for action by smaller groups. Um, there also is clearly a possibility to build a link between global policy leadership and country level action. So Tonna just spoke about this in her uh, concluding comments. ODP, I think, uh, offers a very strong opportunity with the 100 country level action plans that Sanjay Pradhan talked about yesterday that are going on this year to show that what is being discussed at global level is not just rhetorical. This is something that really can be translated into national practical action. Third, I think there's a possibility to build an informal cross-regional coalition of the, the willing between the events this year, who try to take the level of ambition progressively up and build from achievements in one event to more focus on action, more focus on implementation in subsequent uh, events. And fourth, there's a very productive relationship potentially between civil society and uh, governments, member states in this process, which Ambassador Moon, I think, spoke to in his concluding remarks, that there can be a really productive push and pull here where both sides support higher ambition. I would say, Ambassador Moon, with relation to the comment in the chat, which I also saw, I think it is, of course, true that independence uh, from government agencies is very important for anti-corruption mechanisms. But it's also true that there are always two sides to a corruption process. And if one side of that is sometimes government officials, there is always another side, which may be private sector groups or, or groups operating in the private sphere. Coming to my last uh, cluster of points, which is on the very rich discussion that was made of the young gas itself. I think that there may be a very good chance just in the timetable that we're in, in relation to the the negotiations on the political declaration to think about raising the level of ambition and clarity and as i was listening to the many very interesting comments that were made on this 
from Ambassador Luis through to uh, Brigitte and Helen and others. I was thinking we should probably think also what will be the newspaper headlines after the special session? What will the press around the world think has been achieved? And I think it's very important here that they see some practical action which rises to the level of challenge we have in this year of COVID recovery, in this year of great opportunities actually to rebuild relationships between citizens and the state, but also risks that if some of those recovery funds are corrupted, for instance, this could actually diminish trust. Um, that I think could be a mixture of more standard setting advances in the oil and gas, practical instruments and follow on mechanisms. But I agree, I think, with the moderated discussion earlier, that if it appeared that the young guest was only agreeing on follow on mechanisms, that's unlikely to be seen from the outside world as a success. I think it has to be a mixture of some sense of urgent action now and appropriate follow on mechanisms. So just looking very quickly, I won't do justice to all the comments that were made here, but at some of the, the discussion that was made uh, on normative directions, I think there is a real opportunity to look at the evolving face of corruption, the evolving forms of corruption and make sure that the declaration really reflects that. So that could include the links with organized crime and anti money laundering and a stronger focus on that. It could include some of the links with tax evasion that was discussed in the session with Alicia Barsena yesterday. It could include looking at a wider ecosystem of political integrity with a wider sense of what are our instruments to address this from asset declarations to asset recovery to conflict of interest uh, provisions to whistleblower protection. So these are things that would make perhaps a normative shift forward in how we think of uh, of addressing corruption. Second, there's a possibility to agree on some clearer mechanisms and instruments. And I know that uh, this is very much still under negotiation in Vienna, but it does seem that it would be very encouraging for the signals worldwide if we could see something come out of the special session, which has a fairly immediate action level. So we had a lot of ideas yesterday and today on a declaration of public expenditures, on open contracting, for example, on moving forward on beneficial ownership, on asset recovery. I'm sure knowing negotiation processes that it will be not possible to agree on every provision that people would like to see, but it would be good to see one or two clear instruments and action areas coming out of the, of the discussion. And the last point is the clear follow up uh, mechanism with the possibility, I think, of this playing a role both in creating a positive and constructive pressure for implementation and putting into practice the commitments, and also to identify further gaps going forward, since this is a field that is changing and moving very frequently. So it is one in which I think many of the speakers today said we can't be static in our approaches, we need a way of evolving at the same time as corrupt practices evolve. So I'd like to, to close there. I really enjoyed the discussions yesterday and today, and I certainly learned a lot from all the speakers and the questions that came up uh, from the, the floor. I think, uh, as we say, we have a challenge that Alejandro put forward. Alejandro, I see that we have the possibility of missing this golden year of opportunity, but I think the opportunity is still there. So let's see among all of these networks, what can be done to raise the level of ambition and push forward. I'd like to thank again our panelists and from our side, uh, Karina, Paula, Lee, Pfizer and others who helped organize this. And of course, our wonderful partners in the Open Government Partnership, Sanjay and Tonio. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much.